therapy and how that they conduct themselves. So what, what have been your experiences that have ingrained the importance of these, especially if you go on your website, it's very, it's branded in a, in a very, in a very well done way and all your videos are normally done to a professional standard. And when you see it, when you see a lot of people marketing these days where it's just, you know, kind of like a, a very, very DIY way, what has it been that's that's made you really look at how you brand yourself and how you portray people portray you to to the public? Well, I think there are different considerations. I mean, the first thing is that when people are starting out, they may have limitations on who they have, who they can contact, and from a financial point of view, what it is that they can do. So I'm aware of that because I've had people in the past say well, you know, I don't have the money to be able to do this, 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 and this. But here's the thing. A little bit of care and consideration in terms of uh, video quality and sound quality is not something which is difficult to achieve. You know, I had one sort of like persuasion guru send me something once, which I didn't know if it was a DVD or a CD, and it's the worst audio recording I've ever heard in my entire life. Now, these are supposed to be people with sensory acuity. I've also had seen sort of video clips of somebody who was claiming to train people to earn thousands of hundreds of thousands, hundred thousand pounds a year. And they didn't even invest in a tripod to have a, their flip camera still, you know, or put it on a wall so it doesn't move around. Because all of this shows lack of attention to quality and lack of real care in presentation. Now, that's, I think that's really important. So from my point of view, also, if you're looking to build sort of like um, good websites and you're looking to produce good products and to sell things commercially, there should be a certain quality. So finding good people is tough. You know, I use um, the guys at um, Spartacle, which is spartacle.com, because they do a very, very good job for the filming and they do a very, very good job for my um, websites. And I invest back into making sure that things look as good as they can be. Right. Sometimes you're limited by, you know, if you're on location somewhere as to what you can do. But it's really worth investing in your uh, brand image and how you're communicating. Okay. And you, and you spend a lot of time on your website um, making sure that it's it all looks really good and or, or is consistent throughout. Do you? Well, the thing with websites is that what people sometimes forget is this is an ongoing process of making sure that your image is presented properly out of public domain. Now, let me I'll give you I'll give you an example, and I won't mention the name, but there's one trainer reasonably well-known in the UK, presenting with sort of like quite well-known group, corporate website, being offline now for 34 days because they haven't, right. renewed, they haven't renewed the domain name. It's going to be deleted in the next three days because they're not paying attention to their online presence. So they're either not looked at the renewal information or they're not getting hardly any traffic from it because if my website was down for 48 hours, I would know about it. But to be out for an entire month shows that really it's something that's out there, but they're not really paying attention to it, or they don't have technical people paying attention uh, in the right way to making sure that their communication system out to the universe is consistently as much as possible because there can be technical problems there, and their presence is there all the time. So is this person still in business? You would no, you would normally associate that with someone that's just got. And I still get emails from them and other people inviting me to all kinds of courses, including I had one to a women only course. Yeah. It does beg the question of um, how much attention is actually being paid to some of these uh, things that are sent out. So my comment is, yeah, there's always things that we can improve. I look back on previous versions of what I've done and think. It was okay for the time, but this is about sort of improving, um, refining, and developing skills, which means that it's a constant, ongoing process of reflection and improvement. And a website is one of those things. Same thing with um, 
video, same thing with audio. It's really taking the time to do a good job. Because if you're going to charge people for it, um, you need to give people good value. And even if you're not charging people for it, you never get a second chance to make a first opinion, an impression. Okay. So, so if we were to look at um, your experience hosting um, trainings and, and being exposed to a lot of therapists and you also say a lot of trainers, what would you say that you, you've seen as like the traits for those that are successful and those that are not, both in skill development and also in the way that they um, get a, have a busy practice consistently? Well, uh, well, there's a couple of things. I mean, firstly, the secret is to be able to specialize in something, to be able to do something really well. Okay. A lot of people um, who've gone through certain training institutes become almost essentially like, you know, like in the world of music, you have original bands like Thin Lizzy, Bruce Springsteen, etc., etc. Then you have tribute bands who basically emulate everything that the original band was. And there's a market for that, definitely. In the world of NLP, there are essentially hundreds of tribute bands. Very few people actually creating something that's definitively new and interesting. So in order to sort of like the, the um, trainers, in my opinion, who are doing really interesting work, are uh, first of all, they train with a whole bunch of different people and they have a lot of different interests outside the very small world of NLP or hypnosis. Right. This is a bit bigger world than NLP, but that's another story. So they're looking to develop something and usually the ones that do well are people who already have a set of skills and they're using the NLP set to be able to start to develop more elements of the skills that they've already got. So you can look at, say, somebody like um, Al Witten, Fighter's Mind. You know, he's got, he's established his skills in a certain area. He's got evidence of capability. So he's using his insights from hypnosis and NLP to be able to develop what he's already got and develop his own brand. And hats off to him. There are other examples like that. Um, if you take sort of like Andy Austin, I mean, his background was from being a nurse. You know, he will, he will be mindful of a lot of NLP techniques, but like myself, you know, both of us will say, well, a lot of this in, is interesting, but doesn't necessarily translate that helpfully in working with clients or in business. And some of it actually doesn't work, which shock, horror, deep gasp from people listening to this. Surely not. <laughs> Some things, they don't work, you know, um, and yet there's all this incredible insistence that, you know, you can magically read people's minds just by looking at the shade of the color of their skin, etc., 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 etc. Well, I'm all open to ideas, but I'd like to see some demonstration of actual evidence, and whenever you look at this kind of thing, you don't tend to see it, you know. I'd be for very much for like a Penn and Teller fool us TV show where NLPers can actually demonstrate and see if they can actually fool anybody with some really, really good sensory acuity. So yeah. good, good trainers are going to be bringing something different to the table, are going to have an interest usually in one particular aspect, and going to develop you know, better and better skills, and the best ones are doing things that can really help other people. So, so someone's so someone's starting out. Um, that's you know they've just finished their certification, and um, they might not be aware of what could potentially work and what wouldn't. Um, you would hope that they have a, some sort of a BS detector up anyway. But um, what what would be some of the first things that they would do to to ensure that they're moving in the right direction to start a successful practice? Would it be literally what am I good at and what how can I um, how can I use that to to help other people? Is that the type of thing that well, you would be looking for? I think for? the first thing is first thing is if, if well, it depends what they want to do. If it's in business or in therapy, the first thing is to seek out opportunities where they can start to practice and use those skills. Now you know whether you're doing a good job or not by the feedback that you get back. You know, it's very easy. You know, when I worked in the recruitment sector, pretty much standardly. You go in, you'd be given a desk and a phone, and within three months, you need to be able to generate X times what they're paying you as a basic salary. If you don't do that, you don't have. 
a job on the fourth month. Um, so I came from a background where you had to actually produce and demonstrate results. If somebody's starting out, then the smart thing is hang around with people who are very skilled. Hang around with people who've already been there and done the work. But hang around with different people. Because if you just go to the same depressing news group or the same practice group with the same people, you're only getting a certain view and a certain mindset. doesn't mean the mindset's not valuable. It just means that it's one particular way of thinking. And find something that you really enjoy doing, because that's the other thing. Um, when people really love doing or have a passion for what they're doing, then they tend to be better at it. So it's finding a niche that you enjoy and also be practical uh, in terms of the transfer period. If you're thinking about going into earning a full-time living, the idea of literally, I've done my 14-day course, now I'm packing in my highly paid job doing X, Y, Z, and I'm going to be seeing members of the public. A lot of the time, people don't have the requisite skills to be able to attract um, clients and to be able to maintain the attraction of clients to generate an income stream. One of the things in NLP is that they have this obsession with everything being instant, fast, speed, effortless, etc., etc., etc. Whereas in the real world, skills integration, development of any business takes time, takes application, takes integration. And unless you have those skills, you're not going to be able to develop it. Book, a book that's going to be coming out at some point by um, Karen Moxham, who's the uh, head of ANLP, which I reviewed yesterday. I was reading through it and sent through a review for her. Talks in really good common sense terms about a lot of these things. Um, so that's something that's worth looking at. And also talking of books, uh, in November this year, there will be a compendium of a number of different authors and trainers, including myself and Robert Diltz uh, and others, that's going to be launched at the NLP conference published by Crown House Publishing, um, which is talking about uh, NLP for a troubled world, solutions, ways to uh, help clients. And it's a compendium of a lot of different people with all profits going to the uh, NLP recognition and research project, which is being spearheaded by the wonderful Frank Bork and uh, Rich Liotta in the States. Okay. So, uh, when I what was the what was the name of that uh, first book you mentioned? The one with the uh, the one that was uh, the ANLP one. Has, has you got a name for it yet? Oh, um, I believe. Um, oh, now you've, you've got me. It'll be Karen Moxham from ANLP. Um, it's not been published yet, but I believe it is going to be published in the reasonably near future. Right. Sounds um, good. Yeah. I mean, I think what, what NLP would benefit from hugely is just being grounded in common sense with, with um, members of the public. If you look in recent times, if you look at the trend in courses, people don't have the disposable income that they once had. And I think as a trend, NLP's probably peaked and now people are looking for more specialized things. You know, from my perspective, the provocative change works approach works far faster because there's a much more ability to improvise, to be immediate, and a much bigger range of conversational skills. Whereas a lot of NLP tends to, and this is generalization alert here for those listening, tends to be very much geared around techniques and tends to also have a lot of jargon associated with it as well.